All right, hi everybody. Uh, my name is Bennett Foddy. Um, I'm a philosopher at Oxford University, and I also make games at uh, foddy.net and on iOS. And I'm going to be talking a little bit about the relationship between uh, games and real sports. And video games are played in a simulated world with arbitrary rules for imaginary points. Players aren't harmed when they die, and for the most part, they don't have any money on the line. So I think the most fundamental of all design challenges is to make the events in the video game world matter to the player. In particular, the player needs to care about how they play the game. If there's no, if there's no need to play the game well, the player's actions become lazy and then routine. And at some point, the only thing that's keeping them playing is a story that they're passively consuming, or the art, or the Xbox achievement points. A game where player performance doesn't matter might, might still be enjoyable, but it's ultimately disposable. You know, it's a simulation of a simulation. It's like a movie where you have to wiggle a thumbstick in order to keep the projector running. This is what players do to get the frequent flyer achievement in Superman Returns. They're so disengaged that they're not even looking at the screen, not even touching the controller anymore. I think as designers, if we can get players to care about the outcome of our games, they'll be more engaged, more focused, and the games will ultimately be more meaningful to them. But it's a pretty hard problem, since the events in a video game are ultimately they don't matter at all in, in any kind of practical sense. So what I want to talk about is how this, pro this problem is addressed in the world of real non-digital sports. Now, real-world competitive sports, you have to say, I mean, first of all, it, they're not designed, usually, in the same way that video games are. They, they evolve as a set of shared social or cultural practices. So American football, we think, evolved from the ancient Greek game Episkeros, which is pictured here, uh, which in turn surely evolved from an even more ancient game, probably involving throwing rocks at other people uh, in order to hurt them. But if you were designing a, a new sport, like when uh, Frisbee golf was uh, designed, you'd face the same basic design challenges that we face when we make video games. Like games, sports are basically enjoyable or fun activities, but the outcomes in any sporting activity are fundamentally pretty pointless and arbitrary. You might play a sport for enjoyment, but there's no inherent reason uh, why you should care about who wins, who loses, and how people played the game. Despite that, sports have been far more successful at video games at making their performances and their results matter, both to the players and the spectators. Now, football and basketball stadiums routinely filled to capacity. More than a billion people watch the Olympics every four years. And athletes are prepared to, to sacrifice everything to attain the highest possible performance. They train day in, day out, suffering painful and even disfiguring stress injuries. They collapse at the finish line, crying or fainted, they take life-threatening doses of performance-enhancing drugs, even in sports where the financial rewards are tiny, like in the Olympic race walk. Think of Liu Xiang and his crippled hop to the finish line in uh, last year's Olympic hurdles. Now, that kind of commitment would be ridiculous in a video game player, even though video games basically are no more silly, no more pointless than real sports. Of course, part of the reason why athletes care so much about their sports is that there's a huge amount of money and fame on the line, you know, and, pa and part of it is that sports, of course, are just older than video games. I guess if we play Street Fighter continuously for over 100 years and give people a million dollars when they win at Evo, uh, people probably care about it a lot more, that's true. But those can't be the only reasons why people care more about sports. You know, basketball was shown at the Olympics just 13 years after it was invented. The Street Fighter, for comparison, is now 20 years old. Even in sports with relatively small audiences and no prize money, like Little League Baseball, people care much more about the outcome than they do in the case of video games. You almost never hear of people taking a, a game as seriously as this, even though sports are fundamentally just as inessential and arbitrary as video games. No, no competitive video game fills a big stadium or is televised on a major network. There's no bands of violent StarCraft hooligans, no Halo player trading cards. There's no back page column in the local paper. This is how Evo looks, the biggest uh, tournament for Street Fighter. Note that pretty much everyone in the audience here is also a competitor and not just a fan. 
and that's how the Super Bowl looks. So clearly, real world sports are doing something right that video games aren't managing to do. And I, I think as designers, we can take a lot of inspiration from what sports are doing. So that's what this talk's about. I'm going to talk about a few of the things that we can do. I should acknowledge up front that we already have things that we call eSports, I think, legitimately. I, I take it that a genuine eSport really only differs from a non-digital sport in that it in, involves a computer. It has a lot going right for it. So what makes sports or eSports different from games? I think that part of the answer is that all sports, including eSports, are heavily steeped in performance, two senses of the word. First, in sports, there's a big difference between knowing what to do and being able to do it. You have to perform your moves in a way that's not trivial to do. It's not easy to reproduce the same movements twice in a row. And that's one of the things that makes Street, street Fighter a viable sport, while a game like chess isn't. You know, performance in the sense of high performance or performance enhancement. But the second dimension of performance is that sports unlike many games, are performative. Your actions within a sport convey meaning to the audience. Sometimes they convey some of your character, your personality, or your feelings to the, to the people who are watching you. And the presence of the audience, in turn, imparts meaning on your sporting performance, uh, and it makes it matter more, both to you and to the audience. Here's a simple way of looking at it. Usain Bolt probably broke the world record for the 100-meter sprint dozens of times in training, even in competition against his, t his friends and his teammates on the Jamaican track team. But it doesn't count and doesn't matter, and it's some, in some sense it's not even really a sport until the grandstand is full. That's when it goes from being training to being a sport. When you play FIFA over an internet connection with nobody watching except you and your opponent, it's nothing like a sport. So it's not as though only sports-themed uh, games automatically get to be eSports. You have to directly support it in your design. Here's one that does. I think Counter-Strike is more like a sport because even though you play it alone in your bedroom over the internet, it's set up so that the people who lose when you die, you, you form part of a peanut gallery that's forced to watch the surviving players compete for the win. Right? So the, the win matters more in Counter-Strike because your teammates and your, your vanquished enemies are watching and cheering and booing. But you know, I think they could, they could make it matter even more if they altered it so that the players could see or hear the cheers and boos of the, of the ghosts uh, looking on. And not many people know about this, uh, but in I Want to Be the Guy Gaiden, which is a single player game, the developer, Michael O'Reilly, has the ability to visit your game, dr drop in without you knowing at first, give you hints, even manipulate variables to make it harder or easier for, uh, for you to kind of mess with you, right? So the point I'm trying to make here is this. If, if you make sure your game has a, has a physical performance aspect, like Street Fighter, even if only in the thumbs, and if you make it so that it's played in front of some kind of audience, then you can pretty much guarantee that the outcome of the match will matter more to the players and to the onlookers. And that's part of what I think it means for something to be a sport, to perform in front of others, to be watched, cheered, booed. Human rituals in general, whether you think of weddings, funerals, executions, or football matches, don't mean much unless you have participants and witnesses. And the same is true of video games. You can make your game matter just by designing it to be performed in front of a simulated crowd, if you like, in front of a single human being, as in this case, or you can build your game out from the ground up so that it's designed to be watched by a crowd, played at a party. Design your game so that it gives the spectators something to watch for, right? So you also have to be aware that anything that happens between the, player, the player's thumb and the, and the game pad is probably invisible to anybody watching. So this is why Joust works well. All of the motions are out there for everybody to see. Some of the ways that sports make themselves matter to the players come out of that public performative aspect. So for example, one crucial aspect that is basically missing from games next to sports is drama, right? This focus on human suffering, frustration, striving, that's, that's absolutely core to the spectatorship experience in sport. Sports are dramatic because the stakes are higher. And of course, you get higher stakes for free when there's spectators, right? Spectators make you embarrassed if you play badly or proud if you play well. But sports are also often explicitly designed to bring out emotional and physical suffering 
to the maximum allowable degree, right? So in the, in the race walk at the Olympics, or in the Tour de France, Fran the Tour de France it uh, pushes the, the human body to the absolute limits of physical endurance. Uh, baseball is structured in such a way that it puts one solitary away side batter in the path of nine guys who oppose him and tens of thousands of local fans in the, in the bleachers who hate him and want him to die. And I think there's a kind of pressure that comes out of that. Something, something really interesting can happen under that kind of pressure. You know, athletes puke, athletes cry, athletes spit the dummy. And it generates feelings of drama and emotional investment in the players and in the fans and in the press, making sports matter in a way that video games usually don't. And video games do their best to undermine the sense of occasion and the sense of drama that's present in every big sporting performance, right? You, you quick load, you make a little bit of progress, and then you quick save. And the player erases every mistake and they keep every lucky break. And I think this is one of the worst and most pervasive failures of, uh, of game design. Even in games where there's no quick save, we design them systematically so that they avoid, that we avoid the chance that someone will be frustrated or humiliated, you know, and, and, and thereby we also uh, avoid the chance that someone will feel really seriously proud or accomplished. Yeah, but we can easily reverse that. We, we raise the pressure on players by drawing inspiration from things that lend drama to real-world sports, right? So one example is uh, it's embarrassing to screw up in a real sport because the crowd is watching your every move, right? And parlor games, like pool, especially those that, that aren't played uh, with an audience, are more like video games than sports in this sense, right? Because the audience is very small or non-existent. But with parlor games, they've also found, we've found some ways to compensate for the lack of the, the audience, the lack of uh, public shaming, right? So in Australia, the tradition is that if you lose a game of pool without getting a, a single ball in a pocket, you have to pull your pants down ah. and go once around the table. Yeah. Go, Jim. <laughs> <laughs> With that on the line, I think then your performance matters a lot, right? In a video game, you could roll out a ready-made crowd using Twitter by auto-tweeting the poor performance of the player to, to publicly embarrass them. You can design your games with controls that are, that are designed to be physically exhausting, like our game uh, Mega Gurp. In this case, you have to play efficiently or else you'll get like a very painful leg cramp. But maybe the most effective way to raise the stakes in, in a video game is to take the, the most basic thing that makes the results of sporting events matter, right? There is no do-overs in competitive sport. You, you can create a sense of occasion by designing levels that can only be played once or only once a day. Or you could let the players play any time but only challenge for the leaderboard once every four years like in the Olympics. Maybe that all sounds a little bit too radical. I want to say that you can also raise the stakes of a game in more subtle metaphorical ways. In competitive sports, especially boxing, we've developed this kind of complex language around challenging, winning, and losing that includes trash talk or shit talking the other players. My style is impetuous, my defense is impregnable, and I'm just ferocious. I want your heart, I want to eat his children. Praise be to Allah. Are you saying now, Mike? Mike? So that language is used to invoke like, deeper social concepts, like honor and pride in, in sporting results. And I think it increases the stakes, both metaphorically and in reality. We increase the stakes of a sport metaphorically by saying things like, I'm going to bury you, right? Or I crushed you. E even the basic term, you know, I beat you, is a violent term. We borrow the language of deadly combat and violent crime in order to make losing sound a lot worse and more important than it really is. Now, obviously, you can get all the trash talk that you want if you play an online multiplayer shooter, but I think you can also use it in single-player designs where we face the toughest challenge to make players' performance matter. An example would be, devil may cry, shit talks you if you do poorly, tells you that easy mode is unlocked. I did this more ex uh, explicitly in my game, Clop, has this antagonist called Sherrod who literally insults you every time you lose. Now, there's no real-life audience in this case, but in, in this case, the, the, there is this NPC character who forms a kind of a, a peanut gallery, observing and, and reacting and criticizing your performance. And it doesn't really matter what Sherrod thinks of your running style, but it kind of starts to feel like it does. 
And more often in games, we use a visual metaphor for high stakes instead of a verbal one. So if you think about it, this is the reason why uh, so many games use the player avatar's death as the failure state. In fact, I think that's the best or most legitimate reason, uh, the justifying reason, for the amount of violence uh, that we have in single player games. And that's why there's something so unsatisfying about games that bend over backwards to avoid a death state. If the player is invulnerable, there's no metaphor for high stakes. And the outcome of the game starts to feel predestined and meaningless. You think of L.A. Noire, where it's, they made it almost impossible to run over pedestrians. If there's no danger of a penalty, the stakes are lowered. The outcome matters less, and the player stops trying to drive well. Of course, in sports, in real sports, apart from martial arts, I guess, the penalty for failure isn't injury or death. It's just humiliation, frustration, and shame. But that's deliberately designed into sport as well, again, making heavy use of metaphors. For example, sports make heavy use of the concept of nationalism by forming teams around countries. So there's this idea in the player's head, if you're playing for your country, you know everyone in the country is, is watching you and, and depending on you. And I think the Trackmania guys realized that when they made nations, where you can compete to push your country higher up in the ladder, again, like in the Olympics. Now, it's not a real way of raising the stakes. You know, there's no actual benefit to your country to be higher in Trackmania nations. But it's a metaphor for something that matters, just like trash talk. All right, so one final point. In real-world sports, there's this strong ethic of player integrity, which I think is an essential part of what makes the outcome of a sporting match matter to the players and the fans. We spend billions of dollars every year testing athletes for this long list of illegal drugs, right? We have an international panic when Tiger Woods cheats on his wife or when Lance Armstrong turns out to have been doping the whole time. And sporting organizations have sided incredibly heavily against things like match fixing, especially in, in soccer and boxing. In the sporting world, the reason we object to, to fixed games or performance-enhancing drugs is that they violate an ethic of integrity in sport. So integrity is important because it's part of what gives the result of a game legitimacy and importance. If you win because the other team wasn't trying or because you paid for an unfair advantage, then the results of the match aren't interesting. So integrity is part, it's like an important part of what makes the outcome of any sporting event matter. It's really difficult to give single-player video games the same legitimacy when there's no spectators, no human referees, and no one will ever know if you've used a trainer or a cheat code. But I think certain reward structures that we put in our games undermine the ethic of integrity even more, even if you're not cheating. Pay to win, I think, is the video game equivalent of match fixing or doping. If you can pay to improve your performance, by purchasing upgrades or unlocks, and it doesn't matter anymore how well you're playing. Even when it's sanctioned by the developer, even when it's provided by the developer, buying progress undermines the player's integrity. I'd also argue that any game that lets you just exchange progress for time, time for progress, without really trying, is, is essentially suffering from the same problem. So grinding is just paying to win with a different currency time. If you're grinding, it doesn't matter how well you're playing uh, at all. I mean, you can obviously speed up the grind by playing well, but, but you can get more efficiency by playing eight copies of the same game at once. Now, uh, it's true, I mean, one of the things that may jump to mind is that in sport, you have to do something that's a bit grind-like, which is training. You have to train in order to play well. It's not just a matter of showing up on match day and focusing hard. But training also has to be done skillfully. You know, you can't just exchange time for victory in any sport. And people always tell me that they beat Quop. They're really proud and they're really happy. They come and they say, they say that they beat Quop. And then I inquire a bit further and it turns out that they did it this way by kind of tapping the keys as fast as they can and scooting along on one knee. Now, I would feel pretty ashamed to admit that I was playing a game with so little dignity but I'm in, the minor I'm in the minority there, right? You know, we, that's the minority view because we don't have a norm of integrity in video games. So as designers, what can you do to foster that norm of integrity in your game? Well, if you approach your game in the same way as you approach 
a real life sport, the first thing that you do is you do your best to maintain a canonical record of the player's performance, especially in single player. Right? So that might mean doing your best to make sure that the scoreboards are secure or that uh, high scores are validated. It might mean doing your best to make sure that updates to the game rules don't invalidate previous scores. It might mean making sure that players can't pay for better equipment or grind mindlessly to achieve better stats or progress through the game. But if our games don't explicitly reward and support integrity in the players, then I think that they're basically doomed to be disposable entertainment rather than something more. All right, so in this talk, I've argued that the biggest challenge that we face as designers is to make the events in our games matter to players. And I've argued that we can meet that challenge in a number of ways, taking inspiration from real sports. If we're making a multiplayer game, we can give it performativity by placing it in front of live spectators, either online or in live performance spaces. And you can raise the stakes of the game by running one-off tournaments where the player only gets one chance to do well. In the event gaming scene, at Baby Castles, Wild Rumpus, Wegos Rancheros, Prince of Arcade, and so on, we've been doing these things as much as we can. And I think in single player, it's harder, but there are still things that you can do. You can utilize social networks or NPCs to build real or simulated audience. You can enforce permanent consequences uh, to, to bad player performance. You can have one-off game events to build a sense of, of occasion. And you can even jump in and shit talk the player, either automatically or as, uh, as in, I want to be the guy guiding uh, by hacking their game. And you can make sure that they can't win unless they're trying their hardest. Now, I think it's super rare to see single player games or even private multiplayer games that do all those things at once. But games that do will be engaging and they'll be memorable. And I think they'll matter a lot more to the players and to the spectators, just like real single player sports. Thanks very much. We've got a question from Chris. Do you, uh, just can you talk about the, the, cult, the cultivating integrity and the norm of integrity versus like hacking as kind of a metagame thing for games? Like, you know, figuring out a solution to co-op that doesn't require you to play the way you wanted. Can you talk a little bit about the conflict between those? All right, so, okay, so, so the question is, you know, is there a tension between uh, cultivating a norm of integrity and allowing players, I guess, so I guess in, in co-op, I didn't do anything to stop players from, from scooting along on one knee. And even after I realized that they were all doing that, I, uh, I, I could have, I could have, I mean, I, I published it on my website. I could easily have just gone in and made some kind of rule that stopped people from doing that. And I did in Klopp. And I actually, one of, the, one of the things about this is that I, I, I think that if you enforce too hard, if, if you try too hard to force players to play with integrity, uh, there's a risk that it no longer is integrity, right? They're not making a choice to play with dignity uh, that maybe there, there is less dignity after all. And I've been trying it both ways. Um, I actually think that it's better in Quop that I didn't, I didn't enforce it too much. But what I've been trying to do as a developer is going around and ridiculing uh, players who do that. I'm trying to publicly shame them. That's my way as a developer of trying to foster that norm of integrity. I, look, I do, I do believe that games shouldn't, shouldn't be too strict with their rules. Uh, so, so, but but you know, hopefully, hopefully if I put up enough of these slides, people will feel bad about playing that way. All right, next. Hi, my name's, my name's Roy, and I'm uh, developing right now a local, strictly local multiplayer competitive game. And we had an event at a local bar back in Vermont in the States where um, we had people off the streets play, play the game, and we had a tournament. And largely, it was pretty successful, but um, there were still some people in the crowd who were like, oh, why is there a video game here? So my question to you sorry, is, how large of a role do you think the decreasing yet prevalent stigma against video games plays a part in the popularity of video games versus sports? 
Yeah, it's a real problem, right? I mean, uh, we were at the uh, Sony event at, at IndieCade uh, last year, and, and you know, it's, they, they rented out the, the bar, but at some point it was no longer like completely private, and regular people started coming in. And they were mad at us because we were sitting playing Samurai Gun in a big group. Everyone's having a good time. You know, they're ordering drinks. It's not like we're not you know, doing that. And then you know, waitresses start to shut us down, and we've got like these kind of uh, guys in suits and ties who've come from the picture studios, like making fun of us for playing video games in a bar. And you know, it, I can sort of understand it in a way. We've got a whole bunch of uh, cultural norms about those spaces, about what people are doing, and I guess video games are constructed as as not being part of that, right? Like, and that's something that's going to take some time to change. We, we need games that are designed for those spaces. I mean, part of the problem is. You know, we, we're sitting around with this laptop. It's like 15-inch screen. It's four of us huddled around it. There's really, it's very difficult to kind of get the spectatorship aspect going because nobody can see it except for the people who are playing it, right? And nobody actually knows what we're doing because we're sitting here with these controllers and our thumbs are just sort of barely moving. And so to somebody who doesn't know about video games and who doesn't want to get up really close to us, there's nothing in it for them except that we're sort of taking up space and kind of killing their vibe. But when we play, when we run uh, Doug Wilson's game, uh, Johan Sebastian Joust, in the same sorts of spaces, people don't seem to object, right? Suddenly that's something everybody wants to get involved in. So it is possible, I think, we've got two jobs to do. One is to design games that can be played within the kind of context of the existing spaces. And then the other one is that we have to try to support the establishment of new spaces. Uh, you know, like I was supporting LA Game Space, and you know, I've, I've been... Uh, contributed to Baby Castles for many years, Silent Barn. There are, so there are emerging some spaces where we can start to kind of create our own uh, culture in those spaces and, and not be kind of like harshing the vibe of these, uh, these millionaires who've come down from the picture studios trying to have a regular bar experience. Hey, uh, I, it was totally fascinating. I really like the idea of what sports can bring to games. I was wondering um, what you thought about, about uh, what games can bring to sports design. Um, I'm thinking a lot about like current uh, debates happening about rugby rules that are like kind of broken and soccer rules that are kind of broken and what the video game world can bring to sports. Yeah, it's, it's, it's an interesting question. Uh, so when you have like the electronic linesman in tennis uh, or, or in, in uh, soccer, it decides whether the ball has gone over the line. There is definitely a blurring of the lines between video games and, and real sports, right? Uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm all for that. I think that video the reason I'm interested in video games rather than just playing or making sports is that I think that there is something special about video games that you can't get with tabletop games, with, with parlor games, or with real sports, right? I think there is this kind of tight pairing between a system that can react instantaneously and a, a, you know, a human brain and human body uh, that, that allows you to, to, to have experiences and to, to, to produce engagement that sports can't, uh, at least as they're currently envisaged. So I think there is absolutely a lot of room to bring the kind of benefits of video game technology to real sport, and maybe we can have like a best of both worlds. That would be fantastic. So a lot of what you're talking about is certainly relevant to like competitive games and multiplayer games, and um, uh, talking about like you know at raising the challenge and raising the stakes and stuff. That's that those kind of things certainly appeal to people that are really into those sort of competitive games. But I'm I would wonder um, to what extent do you feel like um, that some of these um, prescriptions that you're offering would apply at, like outside of those types of games because obviously a lot of the reason why a lot of games are getting easier or less punishing are to in the interest of you know widening the potential audience do you see that potentially working in a mass market or would it always have to be kind of that niche competitive kind of yeah okay so the, so, so the answer to that is that it's really easy to explain in a kind of multiplayer competitive uh, scheme how to make it more like a sport because sports are kind of often like that but I, I think that there are kind of things lessons that you can take from sports, even if you're making single-player games that are not even designed to have that kind of adversarial, difficult, competitive thing, right? Uh, so if you think about a game like Proteus, which doesn't even have goals. Pro Proteus by Ed Key. So it's a game where uh, you basically just walk around 
a, uh, a beautiful landscape and you experience some sounds and you see some things, right? That's, that's the sort of description of the game. It's amazing. Now, that's the kind of game which is nothing like a real-world sport. But we've had a very good results sort of uh, showing it in public to large groups of people because there is a kind of performance aspect using the music and the visuals. And so it's possible to bring out that kind of experience performance even without the competitive thing, even without the multiplayer thing. Uh, you know, you, if, if you're thinking about how this will be perceived as a performance, you know, even if it's not you know, in a big public space with a huge audience, even if it's just the people in your household who are watching you play over your shoulder while you're playing on the couch, uh, you can design for that. So I, I, I think that it's harder in the case of single-player games, especially single-player games that are not sort of super competitive. But it's still possible to think creatively about this, and I think still you can take some, uh, some inspiration from real, from real sports, for sure. Okay, are we, we're out of time, so thanks very much, everybody.